Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. You will hear adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And The Paranormal with Jason. I think we're going to have a lot of fun. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. Oh, and you just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This 5-Minute Mystery is being brought to you by A Year in Review, Part 2. Yes, the second part of something is the completion of a promise. I know it's a bad thing to break a promise, but I think now that it is a worse thing to let a promise break you. And no, that has nothing to do with our story. Inspector Harris speaking. Yes? What? Gregory Thorndike murdered? Uh, What's the address? Yes? Yes, I'll be right over. Inspector Harris is here, gentlemen. Oh, yes, Oliver. Show him in. Uh, This way, sir. How do you do, Inspector Harris? Won't you come in? I'm James Thorndike, and this is my cousin, Robert Latimer. How do you do? Hello. Mr. Thorndike... The coroner tells me your father died of stabbing. That's right, Inspector. He'd been stabbed right through the heart. Who discovered the body? I did, sir. Yes, Oliver? It was around eight this morning. I was taking up Mr. Thorndyke's breakfast, as I do every morning, and found poor Mr. Thorndyke with that uh, uh, knife sticking in him. I see. Who is the last one to see him alive? Well, I guess I am. I brought up Uncle's milk last night before I went to bed. What time was that? Uh, about a quarter to nine. And the coroner informs me he was killed about 11. Where were you three last night at about 11? At 11? Why, um, well, I was at the movies. Did anyone see you there? Mm, no, not that I know of. Mm-hmm. Mr. Latimer? I'd gone to bed early last night, around 9. I slept right through the entire night until Oliver woke me this morning. Well, Oliver, where were you at 11? I was taking a walk. I felt a little groggy and wanted to get some fresh air. I suppose no one saw you. I'm afraid not, Inspector. Well, this is swell. I've got three suspects and all have flimsy alibis. One of you is lying and I intend to... What's that? Oh, that must be my alarm clock. I set it last night before I went to bed. Pardon me, I'll be right back. What time is it, Mr. Thorndike? Time? Uh, why, it's it's ten, exactly ten o'clock. Thank you. I'm sorry, Inspector. I must have forgotten to turn off the alarm this morning when Oliver woke me. Yes, Latimer? And that forgetfulness is going to land you in the chair. What what do you mean? I mean that I'm arresting you for the murder of Gregory Thorndike. How does the inspector know that Robert Latimer is the murderer? In a moment, we'll give you the solution, but first... Well, here we are again. Not much to go on except that crazy alarm going off in the background. Was that just a decoy, or does it have something to do with the case? Timing is everything in a murder case. The time of the death, like the ending of a story, gives meaning to what preceded it or what comes after. Did you notice what came after? Well, the detective asked what time it was. Is that significant? Let's go see. And now, back to the inspector. Mr. Latimer, you said that you went to bed at nine last night and that you slept right through the entire night. But it's the truth. I am afraid you're wrong, Latimer. The alarm clock just proved that. If you had gone to bed at nine last night and set your alarm clock for ten, as you told me... It wouldn't have gone off at ten this morning, but at ten o'clock last night. Yes, Latimer, you murdered your uncle. And we'll soon get the story out of you. 
at headquarters. <laughs> has to be the worst. Well, maybe not the worst, but pretty darn close. Think about it for one minute. If the alarm was set to go off at 10, then maybe it did and he just didn't wake up. My gosh, I've slept through an alarm before and I wasn't charged with murder. Crazy. This 5-Minute Mystery was brought to you by A Year in Review, Part 2. Welcome to the podcast. Today we have so many stories that I would suggest not shaking a stick at it. Why would I? Good point. I've never really understood that one. We continue with the stories in review from 2020. This time we conclude with August through December. Anything new? Well, yes, actually. There is a classic science fiction story called Stowaway that is nothing short of amazing. That's a good thing. Yes, it is. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? The Sleeping Dragon, Guardians of the Flame, Book 1 by Joel Rosenberg Have you ever played a role-playing game like Dungeons & Dragons or GURPS? These pencil and paper games are a lot of fun and they force you to stretch your imagination to the limits. But what if they were real? Just for a minute, imagine that you are transported to the actual place and forced to put your very life on the line. That is the premise of the book, and here is a clip. Jason, wake up! James Michael's voice rasped. Jason Parker shrugged the hand from his shoulders, reaching for the covers to pull them over his head. But the covers weren't there. Want me to try? The voice was Carl Cullinane's, but changed. A deep, rich baritone. No, we'll do it. You go back to your little friend, Doria said. Maybe she's over her crying jag by now. Jason pried an eye open, squinting painfully in the bright sunlight. Doria knelt on the grass next to him. But it wasn't Doria. Not exactly. She was older, gaunt, the rounded features of her face having changed into the well-defined ones of a thirtyish woman. And her eyes were strange. Nobody had yellow irises, but Doria did, and that seemed... right. Familiar. What the hell? Jason jerked upright, now totally awake. Maybe. He was sitting on damp morning grass, wearing a musky-smelling leather jerkin and dew-damp gray woolen leggings, an ivory-hilted short sword in its scabbard at the right side of his waist a sheathed dagger strapped to his chest beneath his jerkin. He reached his right hand up to his face to slap himself awake. This had all the makings of a bad, bad dream. He missed. Air brushed his cheek. Missed? He looked down at his arm. Instead of a hand on the end of his withered, age-spotted right arm, there was nothing but a naked stump, covered with brown keloid scars. My hand. The world went gray. 
It all began as just another evening of fantasy gaming with James, Carl, Andrea, and the rest. They were ready to assume their various roles as a wizard, cleric, warrior, or thief. But the game master, Professor Deaton, had something else planned for this unsuspecting group of college students. And the game soon became a matter of life and death as the seven adventurers found themselves transported to an alternate world and into the bodies of the actual characters that they had been pretending to be. Cast into a land where they had to find the legendary gate between the worlds to get back home. A place guarded by the most terrifying and deadly enemy of all. Who might that be? Well, you can have this book today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This includes free access to the Audible Plus catalog, which is updated monthly with new titles. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get The Sleeping Dragon, Guardians of Flame, Book One, by Joel Rosenberg. You're gonna love this one. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories in review. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. We are back for part two of our review of 2020. This past year has seen more stories than ever submitted to the show, probably due to self-isolation. We've had more great adventures, amazing encounters, and some strangeness that just can't be explained. This time we finish out the year with August through December. I have picked what I think are the best listener stories from that time. It was a tough job, but I think I've done it. You will have to be the judge. Our story for August is actually two stories sent in by two people who are twins, Mick and Mike Ravage. Nick lives in Forks, Washington, and Mike lives near Longview, which is also in Washington. Not too far from me, actually. Why two stories? I can't split up two brothers. Can I? Here is Mike's story. A year ago, I encountered something in the mountains near Bonneville Dam. Editor's note, Bonneville Dam is located at the beginning of the Columbia Gorge of Washington. I swear this story is entirely truthful, and to be honest, I'm kind of hoping that some of your listeners can help me make sense of it. Some context. I was camping on top of Larch Mountain. I'm also a member of and live on the Cowlitz Indian Reservation. I'm 22, married, and have a three-year-old boy. Basically, my dog was outside the tent, and I was trying to call him in, but there were some coyotes in the area. I'm not sure if they were curious about Tawelich, that's my dog's name, or just hunting. I chased him off, but Twitch, that's what we call him, took off into the deep woods. I know my way around these woods, so I grabbed a machete, flashlight, and headed out to find him. Nothing really happens until I hear those same wild dogs further in chasing something. I run towards it, worried that I'm about to find them ripping my dog apart. As I'm getting closer, I realize the sounds of distress I'm hearing aren't twitches, but a coyote. I quickly flipped off my light and got low. I quietly move closer to see what's going on. Now keep in mind, it was of course dark, but I swear to God that before my very eyes was a very large creature reminiscent of Pumpkinhead, you know, from those horror movies. 
There was something like tentacles this thing was using his hands, and it was just about to tear into this poor coyote. The entire time I was there, it was making this noise that sounded like a creaking door. I crept away, stood up, and then ran home. As I was running, I heard the sound that I will never forget. I will simply describe it as Dying Coyote. When I arrived back, I found Twitch scratching at the tent door. I unzipped it, and we climbed in to where my wife and son were sleeping. I would not sleep that night, and I ended up watching that tent door until the sun came up. This happened a year ago. What do you think I encountered? Mike Ravage, Cowlitz County, Washington. Well, Mike, I honestly have no idea. I did some research and came up with nothing like it. You mentioned the thing looked like Pumpkinhead. Pumpkinhead, also called the Demon of Vengeance, or simply Vengeance, is a fictional character created in the 1988 horror film of the same name. I couldn't find any basis for fact for that film, nor could I find any monster that matched your description. I will say, for a short story, that one ranks up as most terrifying. Thank you for sharing it. This next story comes from Mike's brother, Mick. When Mick heard that his sibling was sending in a tale, he decided to share this. I moved into my current house in September of last year. Since I moved there, I've had a couple strange moments, but nothing that led me to Bigfoot being a possibility. I've had taps and knocks on my house at night and the sound of pebbles hitting my windows. All strange, but nothing concrete. Then one morning, about 3.30 a.m., I was sitting in my living room with my cat. We were just chilling after work. I am a nurse at an urgency care clinic in town, and I had just finished the night shift. I heard a faint groaning or growl-type noise. Truthfully, I thought it was my girlfriend sleeping in the next room. That went on for maybe a minute or so, but it started getting louder. Then, out of nowhere, came a deep growl, and something hit the side of my house. It was big and heavy. I then heard a scraping sound like it was rubbing against the siding, another growl, and then it was completely silent. I assumed, at the very least, that it was in my own head. But then I looked at my cat. His hair stood straight up, and he refused to come back into the living room. I'm a logical guy, and although I am a believer, I know that the chances of an encounter with the big guy is extremely small. So I wrote it off as simply odd. But then I was talking to my boss, and she mentioned what happened to her a few days before. She had nearly the same experience. But in her case, there was physical damage to her home. I decided to check the local newspaper archives and found mention of an incident report from our county about a house that was severely damaged. The couple blamed Bigfoot for the damage and claimed they saw the creature do it. That house was only three blocks from where I live today. Ron, I'm curious for your thoughts. Mick Ravage, Forks, Washington. Well, Mick, there is a belief that is powerful in the Northwest, the belief that Bigfoot exists. While some doubt that such a creature roams the wilderness of Washington, witness who have seen, heard, and in many cases smelled Bigfoot will tell you differently. I myself have gone on Sasquatch hunts near Amboy, Washington, looking for the creature. So I, for one, do not doubt your story. Now we head to September. This story is a unique encounter that Robin Haverslaw had with Bigfoot. Robin and I spoke on the phone and I wrote her story. She lives in Aberdeen, Washington and had her adventure when she was only 12 years old. When I asked Robin what she would say to people that believe that Bigfoot is a hoax, she always says, I just tell them my story. 
With that, here is Robin's story titled, The Encounter at Blackberry Bush. I was hiking with my dad in late September on the west coast of Vancouver Island, which is usually when bears are fattening up for hibernation and most likely to be aggressive, so we were on high alert. It had rained constantly and we'd only seen a single hiker the whole time, and he was traveling in the opposite direction. My dad is really into identifying animal tracks, and the only ones that we had seen so far were a single set of hiking boots coming towards us. All other tracks were washed out or filled with water due to the days and days of constant rain that was doing its best to screw up our vacation. We were approaching a blackberry patch between ridges that hugged a small creek and smelled what we thought was a particularly stinky bear. There were blackberry bushes on both sides of the trail with only about four feet between them. Needless to say, we had our heads on a swivel. There were no overhanging trees, as this particular berry patch was dozens of feet across and two or more feet high. My dad told me to hurry through as quickly as we could and made the comment how smart it was that we were wearing bear bells and how dangerous it is to startle a feeding bear. He was a couple feet ahead of me when I looked down and I saw a footprint. It looked like a bare human foot, except that it was two inches wider and at least two inches longer than my dad's, and he wears size 14 shoes. It also had dermal ridges and only had a couple raindrops in it, so whatever made it stepped there literally moments before. The scariest thing about it was that there were no other prints whatsoever out of the eastern side of the berry patch. I pointed the print out to my father, who looked down and said, Hurry the heck up. We were just about out of the blackberries when my dad stopped short and pointed to a clutch of trees down the trail. Hiding amongst them was a tall, ape-like creature. It was at least seven feet tall, covered with black fur, and had a human-shaped face. It just stood there looking at us and then dodged back into the deep forest. A minute later, we heard an animal scream unlike anything I've ever heard before. It rang through the forest like a church bell and then faded into silence. My dad took out his camera and took a couple pictures of the big footprint. And then he said, in an unusually quiet manner, Robin, my dear, it's time to go home. We reversed our course and even managed to catch up to the previous hiker that we had passed earlier that day. We made camp near him that night, but neither of us got any real sleep. When we arrived back home, my dad developed the film and made a huge print of Bigfoot's foot. That photo still hangs on his office wall to this day. Robin Haverslaw, Aberdeen, Washington when I talked with Robin, I asked her if I could get a copy of that photograph. She was happy to send it to me, and I will have a link to it in the show notes. I want to thank Robin for chatting with me and daring to share her encounter with all of us. Of course, you know that the month of October is my favorite time of the year, and it being the month of spooky, we get some of the scariest stories of the year. I picked this one because it was in response to the one we just heard from Robin for September. Maurice Gill from Whitefish, Montana sent it in and has titled his story, Harold's Home. Hello Ron, I'm writing you with my ghost story. I was inspired to send it in by Robin's Bigfoot tale. In her story, she said that if anyone ever asks if she believes in Bigfoot, she simply tells of her own encounter. I'm here to tell you this. If you ask me if I believe in ghosts, well, here's my story. I consider myself lucky. I grew up in a home that was haunted by the ghost of Harold. That's all we ever knew of him. The name came from when I was a child. I had an invisible friend named Harold. I remember talking to him and even playing with him. My mother would come into my room and we would be lost together in play. 
I don't remember a lot from those years, and as I got older, I talked less and less about him. However, his ghostly actions never subsided. Over the years, we had all sorts of strange events. Things would go missing to only be found in some strange place, or would be mysteriously right back from where it was lost. I remember one time we went on an extended vacation and hired my aunt to house sit for us. When we got back, she was nowhere to be found. She telephoned later that evening and told my dad that she would never come to our house again. I guess Harold caused some mischief while we were away. Another time when I was about 14, I was sitting in the living room watching a movie. I was eating popcorn and waiting for a friend to come over. I heard a knock on the door and I went to answer it. No one was there. I sat back down and reached for my popcorn bowl and it was gone. I was sure my sister had taken it so I charged up to her room to confront her. Not only did she not have it, but she was sound asleep. When I came back downstairs, the bowl was there, but the popcorn was not. By the way, my sister and I were the only ones at home that night. I'm a grown man now, married with kids of my own. My folks still live in that haunted house and continue to have encounters with Harold. However, it all pales to what happened on March 20th, 2008. I had just gone to bed. My wife Sharon was out of town on business, so it was just me and the kids. About 11 p.m., my phone rang. On the other end was just a lot of static and strange sounds that I couldn't decipher. I hung up and went back to reading. Then came a soft knock on the door. It was my youngest, and he said something very strange. Daddy, we need to go over to Grandpa's house. When I asked him about it, he said that a man had come into his room and told him to tell me that. I didn't understand, but then the phone rang again. This time I looked at the caller ID, and it was my folks' number. I quickly answered. There was silence for about five seconds, and then a ghostly voice said, This is Harold, and the line went dead. I quickly packed the kids in the car and headed to my folks' house. When I arrived, things felt strange. I can't explain it, it just was. I don't know why, but I decided to drive by and park in front of the neighbor's house. They were close friends, so I called them and asked if they would take the kids, which they did. I went over to my folks' house and was heading to the front door when something pushed me. I stopped. I looked around and knew that going to the front door was a very bad idea. I walked around to the back of the house and found the door literally pulled off its hinges. I knew something was very wrong and I called the police. They arrived a few minutes later and entered the home. My parents had been victims of a home invasion and the two men were still in there. They had tied my dad up and were grilling my mom about where the valuables were kept. The police had no trouble arresting the two, and thankfully, my parents were not harmed. Nowadays, I'm very thankful to Harold and his protection. He's better than any security system, so if you ever ask me if I believe in ghosts, this is the story I will tell you. Maurice Gill, Whitefish, Montana Amazing. I can honestly say we've never had a story like that in the history of the show. Thank you for sharing your story, Maurice. And I quite agree, Harold is a pretty good security system. Our story for November comes from Silas and Kathleen Greenlee, who currently reside in Vancouver, Washington, but both were born and raised in Tucson, Arizona. I walk the park near my house every day. Doing this means that you're going to get to know your fellow walkers. This is how I met the Greenleys, and this is how I was told their fantastic story. But before we get to their tale, here are the facts. Did you know that according to the National UFO Reporting Center, 
Arizona ranks number seven for states with the most UFO sightings. In fact, over 3,000 reports of UFOs have been filed in the year 2020 in Arizona. That's a whole lot of sightings. Also, the largest mass report of UFOs came on March 13, 1997. This event became known as the Phoenix Lights. So when you hear Silas and Kathy's stories, keep those facts in mind. I sat down at a picnic bench with the two and pulled out my phone to record their story. They told me that they didn't want to be recorded. I could tell their story, but that I would have to write it. I opened an app to take notes and listened as Silas began. We were having a relaxing dinner in Litchfield Park near our home. It was a cool evening and we just wanted to be outside. The weather had been impossibly hot and it was a rare treat to be out. We were putting things away when an object appeared in the evening sky. I am a retired Air Force reconnaissance officer and know a bit about U.S. military craft. This was not one of those. He paused. The object came in from the southeast about 75 feet from our position and about 35 feet above the ground. It had a triangle shape, no visible markings, and seemed to be flat black. It also had a slight shimmer at its edges. There was this deep drone hum. Not really heard, but it was felt. Neither of us moved in fear that something may happen to us. No Betty or Barney Hill thing in our lives. Silas stopped and then smiled. As the craft passed to the northeast, about thirty yards away from us, a beam of brilliant white light shot down to the ground from the front of the craft. It began to sweep left to right, as if it was searching for something. The odd thing was, as this beam struck the ground, there was a disturbance of dust rising as it swept. It was then Kathy took over the story. I started to feel ill, nauseous. I asked Silas if he could feel it, and he told me all he felt was dread. We continued to watch that object as it faded out of sight. The direction in which it was traveling would lead it directly towards Luke Air Force Base. Soon after, my stomach eased and the feeling of dread passed. We both took a deep breath and were about to leave when we noticed that the airbase had come alive. Silas picked up the story again. It was crazy. There were searchlights, sirens, and military police all along the security fence. We saw this because the park is on a slight rise above the base. We walked to our car and drove to the base. It was shut down, the main gate was closed, and MPs were not allowing anyone to enter. I even have a VIP standing at the base and was told to turn around and come back another day. The next day, the local news reported that a coyote had set off the perimeter alarm. It was not a coyote. The two continued to talk about their adventure. They spoke to friends and family, but no one else had seen the craft that night. The next time Silas found himself at the airbase, he spoke to several airmen friends of his and confirmed that the coyote story was just a ruse. But none of them saw anything that could have triggered the perimeter alarms. In the end, it was all quite a mystery. However, the Greenleys stand by what they say, but will only say that it was a UFO and nothing more. I want to thank Silas and Kathy for sharing their story and allowing me to tell it to you. I did change their last name at their request. Well, we've reached the month of December 2020, and here's the problem. Because of all the special episodes we did, there were no new listener stories. However, there were several sent in, so what we have to represent is a brand new story from Claire Farmer, who happens to have been raised in a farmhouse in Kentucky. How about that? Here is her story titled, Firebug Ghost. Let me just say that everything I'm about to tell you is completely true, and in no way some paranoid fantasy. I'm not the only one that has experienced things, in our old farmhouse. My parents decided we needed a bigger place because my youngest sister was just born, so they moved us into an old farmhouse. Cliché, right? 
At first, it was pretty cool. I mean, everyone had their own room, and we even had a sitting room upstairs. About a month after we moved in is when things started to get weird. My mom, who at the time was still recovering from having my sister, usually stayed in the downstairs of the house during the day. But on this day, she had to go upstairs and check on something, for some odd reason. When she left our room, I got a really bad feeling, and it was proven correct, because while my mom was standing at the top of the stairs, it looked like someone shoved her, and she ended up nearly hitting every step. Luckily, my dad came home about three minutes later and took her over to the hospital. No serious injuries. About five months later, my dad had to have minor surgery that required him to stay awake for 48 hours beforehand, so my cousin came over to help keep him up. My dad decided that he wanted to have a cold shower, so he went upstairs. About ten minutes later, my cousin saw a shadow come down the stairs and yelled at what he thought was my dad. Hey, why are you just standing there? There was no answer, because my dad was not there and still in the shower. After that, my cousin refused to stay the night at our house ever again. At that time, I was around eight years old, and I know that people are thinking that it was just my imagination, but honestly, I was a pretty down-to-earth kid that really didn't daydream. I walk up to go to the washroom about six in the morning, which is only about an hour earlier than I'm used to getting up. When I came out, I saw a woman in a white nightie going down the stairs. At this time, I really wasn't scared because I assumed it was my mother, so I followed her down the stairs all the way to the kitchen. But as soon as I got to the kitchen, she was gone. I said, Mom, where did you go? Then I heard my mom yell at me to get my butt back upstairs. I went back up and asked how she managed to get here so fast, and her face, well, it was white. She grabbed me and my sisters and brought us all into their room and sent my dad down to check it out. He came back up about twenty minutes later and said all the doors were locked and he didn't see anyone. Years later, my mom told us that she had seen the woman in white many times over the years. About a year after that, I was getting ready for bed and, as usual, left my clothes on the floor next to my bed and went across the room to turn on the nightlight. Now, that was not because of fear of the dark, so please don't assume. It was there because there was no other light in my room. It had one of those covers on it to dim the light, which I never took off because if I did, I wouldn't be able to go to sleep. At around 5 a.m., I woke up having trouble breathing and I noticed that my wall, where the nightlight was, was on fire, and my pants the day before were on top of it. I ran to my parents' room and told them. And my dad ran into the room with a fire extinguisher and put it out, and then both my parents scolded me for throwing my pants across the room. I told them I didn't do it, and at first they didn't believe me, until my mom went into the room and noticed that my shirts, socks, and underwear were still beside my bed, and that the shade for the nightlight was on the floor. Years passed, and all of us kids left that old farmhouse, each of us with many spooky stories. My parents eventually sold the place and moved to Florida. I went back to that town about five years ago and found out that the house that we lived in had burnt down. I personally talked to the fire marshal about it, and he said that it was faulty wiring, but the findings were inconclusive. Two children were injured in that fire, and the family pet was killed. That information sent chills down my spine. Claire Farmer, Kentucky Well, thank you for that one, Claire. And that ends the 2020 review of stories. I hope you enjoyed going through them. I guess I would have to say is if there was one good thing that came from our cursed year, it was that we had some of the best stories ever in the history of the podcast. I want to thank everyone that sent in a story during the year, and it is my hope that that trend continues in 2021. 
If you want to share your story, head to ronsamazingstories.com and click on the story submission banner. Now there has been a slowdown in the stories, probably due to the holidays, so please start sending them in again. Also, now that the holidays have passed, I'm going to continue work on the new podcast, so if you want to share your story live, please sign up for that. Thank you again for sharing your stories in 2020. As read by Amazing Stories, read by Amazing People. This time on As Read By, we have an absolute treat for you. We have an amazing story suggested by German Finley and read for us by Matty Ruth. The story is about the first rocket to the moon and one man's attempt to stow away aboard it. The tale? Well, that's not the remarkable thing here, but Matty's reading is the stuff of wonder and charm. She brings it to life in a way that can only be described as magical. The story is titled The Stowaway, and it first appeared in If, Worlds of Science Fiction Magazine, March of 1952. He stole a ride to the moon in search of glory, but found a different destiny. Please enjoy The Stowaway. His eyes were a little feverish, as they had been of late and his voice held a continuous intensity, as though he were imparting a secret. I've got to get on that ship. I've got to, I tell you, and I'm going to make it. Different members of the group regarded him variously, some with amusement, some with contempt, others with frank curiosity. You're plain nuts, Joe. What do you want to go to the moon for? Sure, why you wanna go? What they got on the moon we ain't got right here. There was general laughter from the dozen or so who sat eating their lunch in the shade of Building B. They all thought that was a pretty good one. Good enough to repeat. Sure, what they got on the moon we ain't got here. But Joe Spain wasn't in the mood for jokes. He burned with even greater conviction and stood up as though to harangue the workers. You want to know why I got to go to the moon? Why I've got to get on that ship? Then I'll tell you. It's because I'm a little guy, that's why. Joe Spain, working stiff, one of the great inarticulate masses. More laughter. Where'd you get those big words, Joey? Out of a book? Come on, talk English. Joe Spain pointed to the huge, tube-like building A off across the desert the building you had to have two different passes and a written permit to enter, the mystery building where even newspaper reporters were barred. It's only the big shots they let in there, ain't it? Only then that's got a drag or went to college or something. Us little guys, they tell go to blow. Ain't that right? Who the hell cares? Maybe it's a damn good place to stay away from. Maybe it'll explode or something. Who wants to die and collect his insurance? I've got to get on that ship when it blasts off because they can't push the masses around. We got a right to be represented even if we got to sneak in. Me? I'll stay on the ground. And besides, there's the glory. You guys are too stupid to see that, but it's there. The glory of being on the first rocket ship to the moon. The name of Joe Spain, written down in the history books and said over by people and school kids for thousands of years. Immortality, that's the word. Well, just forget about it, Joe, because you ain't going. Joe Spain's eyes burned brighter. Joe Spain, coming down the ramp with the bitch shots when it's all over. News cameras snapping, people asking for interviews. But you ain't going because... Joe shouted at the men. And another thing, us little people are entitled to a representative aboard that ship. We got a right to know what's going on. How come there's nothing about it in the papers? Only the big shots know about it and whispering among themselves. 
It's because they're trying to snag it all and freeze us out. You're crazy. It's for security reasons. It's all hush-hush so it won't leak out like the atom bomb did. The big boys are being smart this time. And you ain't getting on, the interrupted man repeated doggedly, because there ain't a way in God's world to get on. With triple security all around the building, just tell me a way to get in. Just tell me one. I'm going on that ship, Joe Spain said. Then he clammed up suddenly. Joe Spain wasn't stupid. He was a talker, but he knew when to stop sounding off. The men went back to work, shifting the big aluminum barrels from trucks into Building B, carrying the wooden crates and the paper-wrapped parcels up the ramps and to the side of the building facing the big secret structure labeled A. They worked until five o'clock. Then they filed out and got into the waiting trucks and were hauled back to town. The boom town that had mushroomed up at the desert overnight and would die with the same swiftness when the project was completed. Joe went straight to his rooming house, washed up, put on his glig clothes, and found a stool in a nearby restaurant. He ate a leisurely supper, glancing now and again at the clock. When the clock read eight, he went out into the neon-stained darkness and walked three blocks to the Black Cat, one of the three nightclubs the desert town boasted. He went to the bar and ordered a drink. He downed it slowly, carefully, after the manner of a man who wanted to stay sober. A half hour passed before a thin, nervous individual elbowed to the bar and stood beside him. Joe said, Hello, Nick. You been thinking it over? I need a drink. Sure, Nick. Then we'll go someplace and talk. But Nick got rid of five drinks while Joe protected his own glass from the barkeep. After a while, Joe said, I'm willing to up the price, Nick. Two thousand. Cash. All I got. Let's get out of here, Nick mumbled. They walked out of the town and into the desert. Nick stumbling now and again to be supported by the tense, sober Joe. Two thousand, Nick. You need the dough. Sure, need the dough, but it wouldn't work. Couldn't get you into one of them barrels. You wouldn't have to. All I ask is that you come along in the morning and seal me up in one. All you have to do is lock on the lid. How do you know the barrels are going on the ship? Never mind about that. I just know. I paid to find out. Okay. Suppose you do get on the ship in a barrel. Maybe it'll be stored in a hold somewhere. Maybe they wouldn't open it very soon. You die. I got a way to get out. One of them special torches. The little ones. Aluminum isn't very strong. I can cut it like butter. It'd be hot. You burn yourself. Let me worry about that, Joe said fiercely. You want the two grand or not? Nick wanted the two thousand, and he was against the wall for excuses. Then he had a happy thought. Barrels is airtight. You'd smother. Things impractical. We'll, we'll forget it. I won't smother. I'm taking my own oxygen. Enough to last me clear to the moon if it has to. Come on, break down. Okay, for two grand. Gotta have the dough now, though. His heart singing, Joe Spain counted out 2000 in cash. When he'd finished, he had exactly $9 left. He was a pauper. But the happiest pauper who ever bought with his whole fortune the thing he craved most. You won't double-cross me now, will you? If you've got any ideas like that, I'll do like we said. Nick Sparks never went back on his word. Never. But how you going to stay hid when it's time to leave work? Leave that to me. It'll be easy. They don't check building B too close. No double check cause it's over a mile from building A outside the safety perimeter. I'll stay in tomorrow night and I'll put a little chalk mark on the barrel I'm in right near the top rim. First thing you do when you come to work the next morning is seal it and line it up with the filed ones. Okay. But I gotta go home now. 
I gotta head. I gotta get some sleep. What's in the duffel bag? Clean overalls? Towel. Joe pulled the zipper down halfway. The guard fingered the blue denim but didn't dig deeper to find the towel. He checked Joe's badge number, made a note on his pad, and motioned to the next worker. Joe let tight breath slowly out of his lungs as he walked toward Building B. Getting past the guard was a load off his mind. He'd expected to get by, but it was one of the calculated risks that could have stopped him cold. Once inside the building, he put the bag into his locker and went to work. He labored briskly and carried more than his share of the load. But now and again, he stopped to look over at the outline of Building A, lined hard against hot, blazing sky. And each time, it was with a sense of heady exhilaration that he thought of his destiny, his hard-earned, dearly bought destiny. To be among that select group who had first set foot upon the surface of the moon. He had no worries about not being allowed to do so. Once he showed himself, with the ship far out in space, they'd have to accept him. Not graciously, of course, but they'd have to admire his courage and tenacity. They could not, in all humanity, deny him a share of the victory. The day wore on, and as quitting time approached, he became more tense, more alert. Five minutes before the whistle, he faded back into the building and hurried to the lavatory. He went into the booth furthest from the entrance and locked the door. Now, there was nothing to do but wait. Another of the calculated risks. The whistle blew. Almost immediately, the sound of footsteps broke the silence and the lavatory was filled with hurrying men. Their stay in the room was short, however, as Joe had known it would be. Men leaving for home do not dawdle on the premises. The lavatory was empty again. A period of silence while Joe raised his feet from the floor and braced them on the toilet seat. The entrance door opened. A guard making the departure checkup. Joe held his breath. If the card came down the line and tried the door, he was finished. But Joe had banked upon human nature. The guard stopped. For a long moment, there was no sound, and Joe knew the man was bending over to run his eyes down the line of toilets close to the floor. In this manner, he could see the floor of every booth. The guard straightened, turned, Walked out. The door closed. Silence. Joe's heart swelled with gratitude. He grinned, looking forward with joy to the long night ahead. He found a spot over behind the barrels where the night watchman would have to climb over a lot of equipment in order to find him. He made himself comfortable, practically certain the guard would not do this. He stretched out on the hard floor and recorded the passing of the hours by the number of times the watchman went through, and he was surprised at how fast the time passed. Finally, checking his count carefully, he left his hiding place and tiptoed to the line of lockers. He took the oxygen equipment from the duffel bag, after which he hid the bag and the clothing therein behind a wall flange in the far corner. Then he climbed into the barrel at the front end of the packing line. He checked the barrel with a small X and jockeyed the lid into place. Time passed. Nothing happened. He wondered if he'd missed on that time element. The men should certainly have come to work now. More than once he was tempted to push the barrel lid aside and check the situation. When footsteps sounded close by, and the lid snapped firmly into place, he was glad he hadn't done so. Good old Nick. When he got back from the moon, he'd see to it that Nick got credit for his courageous act. Soon the barrel began to move. Joe felt it rise into the air and settle with a thump. Then the motor of a truck roared, and Joe knew where he was going. Straight toward Building A and the moon rocket. 
there was more movement until finally the barrel was set down for what appeared to be the last time. Joe put a nose piece of the oxygen tube into place and visualized himself safe and snug in a storage room of the rocket. He closed his eyes and went peacefully to sleep. He slept a long time, to be awakened by a crushing, a wrenching that all but drove his head down into his spine. The pain brought him sharply alert. He knew instantly what had happened. Blast off. He braced himself against the sides of the barrel and gritted his teeth. Soon it was better. Then no pressure at all. Only the fierce happiness on his heart. He'd set a course and won through. He was on the way to the moon. Joe let plenty of time elapse. He knew it was well over an hour later when he unlimbered the torch to cut an escape hole in the barrel. This, he knew, would be tricky. He could easily burn himself. The heat would be intense. But it wasn't too bad. The aluminum cut quickly, and in a matter of minutes, he was standing beside his barrel. As he'd suspected, it was a storage hold. The pitch darkness did not bother him. He'd come prepared with a small pencil flash that threw an adequate beam. He found the door, opened it, and went out into a long passageway. Now he'd covered the length and breadth of the ship. He'd found a lot of rooms, all in pitch darkness, no observation ports, and no living thing. He stood frozen in one of the rooms while the beam of his flash picked out a code stenciled on a steel plate over some piece of machinery. X-59... 306MY Experimental Explosion Rocket Moon The flash dropped from Joe Spain's fingers. He stood in the pitch darkness while the jets vibrated through the rocket. But there was no fear in him. Only the great pain of futility. Only his tears and his whispered words. They'll never know. Nobody will ever know. End of The Stowaway by Alvin Heiner First, let me thank German Finley from Montreal, Canada for suggesting this story. I first went to the Gutenberg Project to verify that it was public domain. Then I headed on over to LibriVox to see if anyone had ever recorded it. I was very happy to find Maddie's version, and I think we'll all agree that she did an amazing job. Thank you, Maddie. I tried to track down some information on the author of our story, Alvin Heiner, but as is the case with a lot of the Pulp Mag stories, there is nothing about the man. It could have been a pen name, or perhaps this was the only story he ever published. Who can say? I do know that it was published in If Magazine, which was in publication from 1952 to 1974, with a brief comeback in 1986. How about that? episode number 473 and is the first new show of 2021. I want to thank German Finley and Maddie Ruth for our featured story today. It was a good one. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it, and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories.